Welcome to the Living Well Church podcast and thanks for tuning in today. Our mission as a church is to help people find faith in Jesus and a life of purpose and hope. You're about to watch a message that will challenge you, inspire you, encourage you and most of all point you to Jesus and the life of purpose and hope he has planned for you. So lean in and enjoy and let God speak into your life. Thanks, Marcus. Good morning. Good to see you. It's great to be together uh, in this part of England where the sun always shines, where it's always warm and pleasant as it is today. God bless. Good to see you. And uh, I just want to share some things this morning that uh, I believe that the Lord laid upon my heart, not just for this church, but indeed for this country. Uh, They are things that God impressed upon my spirit in the early part of this year while Alita and I were in Australia. And uh, I really felt that God was speaking to me, not only uh, about individual churches, though that is certainly true, uh, but also about the nation and about the place of this nation and the economy of God as he moves forward into the days that are ahead. I think that God has something very significant for this country. It's been so in the past, and I dare to believe it will be so again, that God will do some wonderful things through his church. In this nation. Do you believe that? A couple do. (laughs) What about the rest of you? Do you believe that? That God has something really good for you. A few months ago I was in a meeting. It was here in Dover. It was in an Anglican church and Neil uh, was leading some songs for a group of men. It was about the run up to the summit event that was running last year. Uh, Neil stood uh, in that church and uh, relative to where I am standing now, he was pointing to a place that was behind him as he spoke. Some of you may remember. Only men, of course. And uh, as Neil spoke, he was speaking about an experience in his own life that had taken place some years before. And in that Anglican church, and Neil can correct any of this that's wrong, but uh, as, he, as he stood in that Anglican church some years before, he'd had an encounter with the living God. In that church as he stood, uh, no doubt a much younger man, uh, he stood over there in that place and here all of these years later, he could still remember that church, that place, that experience. And I want to go today into some things that God is speaking to us about. They're not so much locations as they are experiences. And God wants to take us on a journey of experience and a journey of an experience that will unlock the power of his word, release the power of his spirit, that the church can be in the nation what God intends that it should be. So as we open the scriptures today, we're conscious of the goodness of God, the power of God, the presence of God and how available he is to help us. As in the songs that we've sang today, All of the things that we read in the scriptures and most of the things that we sing, they are really all about Jesus. That last song that we sang was really drawn from Luke 15 where there's the story of a shepherd who pursues a sheep. It's a great story, but it's not really a story about a sheep and a shepherd. It's a story about Jesus and his love for people. And as I open the scriptures today, I'll be in the Old Testament and you might say, well, that's thousands of years ago and that's true. But in reality, these are pictures of the reality of Jesus, ways that he works, things that he does, not just in the days of the Bible, Old or New Testament, but in this day. This is what he is still doing today. It is still what he's building in the day in which we live. So as we open the scriptures today, we're in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2. It's a moment of transition and it seems to me that we are in a moment of transition in the life of the church in this nation. It may be true of local congregations, but it's also true of the church as a whole in the nation, that we're in a moment of transition, a season, if you will, of transition where we are coming from one era and we are stepping into another. We are at that point where those two eras cross over. The past is behind us and we can celebrate all that it was, but it is in the past. And what we have to unlock is the future and we do that not by rejecting the past, but by taking those keys, 
those experiences of God that we have found and we build those into our future and we'll see that in 2 Kings chapter 2 today. Like I said, we're talking about something that happened thousands of years ago, but I submit to you that the power of this is a contemporary power. It's relevant to us today. What God was doing then, he is still doing now. Amen? And so in 2 Kings chapter 2, just one verse that we'll start by reading, and it's this, it's 2 Kings chapter 2, and I want to demonstrate to you that I'm as contemporary as Marcus. Right? I got one of these things too. I don't like it a lot, but I, I got one. Here it is, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. It's, uh, it doesn't sound very exciting as it starts, but it does suggest that there is a moment of transition in their lives. This happened in the final days of Elijah and the early days of Elisha. And there was a journey that both of them walked together. It was not one or the other. This was a season of both together. That's the season that we're in right now in the church. We who are older cannot do it without those that are younger. Those that are younger cannot really release the power of God unless we stand together in God's purposes. I would love that we are able to embrace each other irrespective of our gender, irrespective of our age, irrespective of any other disqualifying feature that every one of us understand that in Christ there is none of those divisions. For all are one in Christ, no longer male, female, bond, free, Jew, Greek, but all are one in Christ. And it is the unity of Christ's body that God is calling to embrace the future. But there is a, sh a shift, a, a transition from what God has done in the past to a new thing that God is doing today. It won't be disconnected to the old thing, but it will carry the same values, a greater release of power, a, a further release of authority, and a, and, a, and a creative expression of the Spirit of God. These two men started on their journey and they had been walking together for a season. It had been so that Elijah knew that his day was coming and God would take him. But he knew also that he needed to find the next generation. He needed to find the, the representative of the next generation. So he looked and he found a young man called Elisha. He saw him plowing a field and so he took his mantle over to the young man and he threw it across him. He threw his coat, as it were, across the young ploughman. It was an interesting thing to do and it probably doesn't mean much to us. If somebody th came and threw their coat over you today, you might sort of wonder what was going on. But in reality, he was an investment that the older man was making in the younger man. And in the, in the economy of the day in which they lived, it was a symbol, it was a sign of this embrace. It was to say that here is an older man, a prophet of God, a man who has walked with God, who has spoken into the ear of kings, I now come and I embrace you, a younger man, and I invite you to walk with me in this journey of representing God to this nation and bringing this nation to God. Here was this journey that started. Notice it started with the older, embracing the younger. I want you to know how important young people you are in the economy of God. And as somebody with a few grey hairs beginning to show... You may not have noticed because the light will cover them, but, but with a few grey hairs beginning to show, I, I, want to, I want you to know, young people, that we embrace you. We love you. We need you. And we want to release you into the call of God and the purpose that God has for you. I don't care if you're 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. God's hand is upon you. And right around the world, the same thing is true, that 80% of people plus come to Christ by the time they are 18 years of age. Let's begin to put our nets into the place where fish are biting. Let's begin to sow into the place where God is shaping young lives and forming them for the future. Every young person that's here, whether I know many of the younger children are gone, but I'll refer to those that may be here, young teenagers, 
middle teenagers, older teenagers, kids in your 20s. God's hand is upon you and we the church want to put our mantle over you that you will be incorporated into what God is doing today and in the future. Amen? Amen. The journey started in a place called Gilgal. Gilgal was an interesting place and means nothing to us today. It would be like me saying to you something about... Uh, Ballarat, if I were to mention a place in Australia, every Australian would know what happened in Ballarat in 1854. It was the gold rush that started there in 1851 and by 1854 there was a great rebellion in a place called the Eureka Stockade. You wouldn't know that, you probably never heard of that. It would be like saying something to me about Runnymede, 1215, the signing of the Magna Carta. I wouldn't know anything about that. And, and so it was in in Gilgal that we read that name and it means nothing to us but every person that comes from the background of the, the nation Israel the nation of the Bible they would understand there is a significance about Gilgal as there is to me or you about parts of our national history and they would know that that was a significant place and they remember not the place but the experience like Neil remembered not so much the place as the experience where Jesus revealed himself as a young man and his life was transformed forever. And in that place of Gilgal, this is what happened. It went right back in their history to the time of Joshua. And in the time of Joshua, they were now a people, Moses now dead, the people now out of Egypt. But the experience of those people was this, they'd come out of Egypt, Moses had delivered them with a strong hand. He had defeated the army of Pharaoh. They had drowned in the Red Sea. They'd crossed through the, the wilderness. They'd come over the River Jordan and they'd come now into the land that God had promised them. But all the while, whether it was Moses before or now Joshua, there was something about these people that had not changed. I'll say it like this. They had come out of Egypt, but Egypt hadn't come out of them. All the while, from one generation to the next, they still thought and acted as though they were slaves. In the journey with Moses, they said, Moses, why did you bring us out here? Are there no slaves, that, uh, are, there no, uh, are there no graves that we can be buried in Egypt? They realised that even though they were out of Egypt, yet Egypt was in them. And they still functioned as slaves, thought as slaves, even though in reality they were no more slaves. And it wasn't until the day of Joshua that they came into this, this now, this new land, this promised land, this, this land that God had given to them. They came into this land and God met them at this place called Gilgal. And you can read about it in, in Joshua chapter 5. And God says to them now, Joshua, I want you to, 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 to tell these people, I want you to get it through their, their thick heads. That's not in the original, it's a bit of a paraphrase. Get it through their thick heads that they are no more slaves. The reproach of slavery is rolled away. You, you've got to get it through their heads that they are no longer to think as slaves, to function as though they are slaves, but to be free on the inside. And it was in that place that the language was this, the reproach of your slavery is rolled away. It, this is... A starting point, as it were. And it doesn't matter whether you're of the old generation, of the new. This is the fundamental building block of the church, its mission and its ministry to the world. We have a gospel that sets the prisoner free. Amen? We have a gospel that sets the, liber the, the captive at liberty. We have a gospel that turns the light on for people who live in darkness. We have a gospel that is the power of God to save and to set free. I can see you're excited about that. That's, that's thrilling. But we have been set free and we are free indeed. Amen? amen. If you know that and believe it, say amen. amen. We are free. We are free indeed. The Bible says this, 2 Corinthians 5, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. And that new creature is free, no longer bound, no longer captive. Now, it's possible to live in the thrill and the joy of that experience your whole life. It's possible to go through your whole life and live in Gilgal, that is to say, to enjoy the Gilgal experience, to say we are no more slaves. We are free, we are free, we are free indeed. 
But in the journey that these two men t- took together, Elijah and Elisha, they didn't stay in Gilgal. Would have been good if they did, but they didn't. They carried on. You see, there was something that God was saying to them. There was something that Elijah was saying to Elisha about this journey. You can't stay in one place. You've got to move on. You can't stay back there, Neil. You've got to move on. Church, you can't stay where you are. You've got to advance in the purpose of God. You must move on. And so the next place they came to was a place called Bethel. Bethel. For those who are fluent Hebrew speakers, you will know that means the house of God. Are there any fluent Hebrew speakers today? That's good. Pleased about that. But it means the house of God. It's an experience again like Gilgal that has significance in the national story of the people of Israel. They could go back, as could we, to Genesis chapter 28 when that, when that place is mentioned the first time. You'll remember that story. It was the story of a, a young refugee or a runaway, a, a fugitive called Jacob. He's on the run. He was estranged from his family. He had acted in a way that had broken relationship and he was right out there in the desert. He was so far removed from civilization that when he came to that place at night, he took a stone and used it for a pillow. You ever stayed in a hotel like that? (laughs) Premier Inn can do that for you. They can give you a stone for a pillow if you really want one. But here it was that this young man was so far removed from everything that he was right out there on the run, broken covenant, broken relationship, broken everything, and he's sleeping under the stars with a stone, a rock for a pillow. It was in that encounter that would follow in the next few hours that his life and history was transformed. In the next few moments, next few hours, as he slept on his stone, he began to dream and God broke into his consciousness through this dream. He saw things in a dream that transformed him, that changed him. He was never the same again. He woke from his dream with with three understandings that he didn't have before. You can read this in Genesis chapter 28. His first was this, God is here. God is here. How many know God is here? Yeah? How many know God is here? God is here. And he said, God is here, but I didn't know it. It was that God is present. God is here. That's true for us. We need to get that revelation from that prophetic word that came a little earlier that God is here, he's here tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, anywhere you are, any place you're at, God is there. He's there before you got there, he's there while you're there and he'll be there after you've gone. God is here. This is the omnipresent God. You cannot go to a place where he is not. It is the revelation of Psalm 139 on the top of the highest mountain or into the deepest ocean, God is present. And this was what Jacob began to see in his dream. He began to see God as sovereign. He saw that God wants to traffic ministry from heaven to the earth. He wanted, to, he wanted uh, Jacob to see that God is interested. He's not aloof or far away. He's not disinterested, but he actually sends ministry from the heaven to the earth. Jacob said this, God is here. Then he said this, this is the house of God. This is the house of God. He saw in his dream a picture of God dwelling in the midst of his people. He saw God having a a place on the earth where he would dwell. We we know the unfolding that first if it it was a tabernacle, then it was a temple, then Jesus was revealed as the, as, as the house of God on the earth and now the church is the temple of the living God. We see this progression through history and all of it fulfilling the dream that Jacob saw. Jacob saw the house of God and now we are the dwelling place of God, we the church. And then he said this, this last thing, this is the very gateway to heaven. Speaking about the church, talking about how the church is the entry point into the life of God. It's not just the church as we meet together on Sunday, it's we as individual members of the church who go about our mission and our ministry on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. We are still 
God present among people. We are still an open door to heaven. We are still the gateway to heaven that God wants us to be. Jacob saw all that. It changed his direction of travel. It changed his character. It changed his relationships. It restored every broken thing in his life. Even his name was changed as a result of this encounter with the living God. What a transformation. So they moved from a place where they celebrated simply that they were no more slaves. Now they moved to a place where their understanding is that God is present. God is present. God is here. He has not abandoned us. God is here. In your Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, in your university, in your workplace, in your home, in your hospital, God is present. And you can't go to a place where God is not. You can't go to any place you could imagine where God is not present. And if God is present, then he is present to strengthen you, support you, enable you as you move through that place in victory. Amen? But they didn't stay there. And all the while there were these prophetic sounds. Prophets who would come, the sons of the prophets, who would come and prophesy. And they would say, hey, don't you know today is the day that your master is going? And you know what? Because of the initiative that the older man took towards the younger man, the younger man would constantly say, be quiet. I know what God is doing, but as the Lord lives and as my master lives, I will never, never leave him. How would you like a relationship like that? A relationship like that, that's as rock solid like Ruth and Naomi, where you go, I'll go. Where you live, I'll live. Your people, my people. Where you die, that's where I too will be buried. This, this closeness of relationship, and it's initiated by the older who will throw their mantle over the younger. If I had a mantle, if I had one, I would throw it over every young person in this building as an indication that we want to release you into the promise of God, into the purpose that God has for you, and to raise you up as leaders, not in the sometime future, but beginning today, right here, right now, to understand the call of the sovereign God that's over your life. Amen? Amen. But they didn't stay there. They'd been in two good places. Good Gilgal, good place, nice scenery, nice ambiance that's a good French word isn't it I was telling Marcus before that he mentioned that GDPR thing you know I spent most of last week Alita and I spent most last week in uh, Europe it was very interesting how it was responded to amongst represent representatives of various European countries the Germans attitude was very clear we will obey immediately we will Cross every T and tick every box. The Italians and the Spanish and the French. What is it? <laughs> we have never heard of this thing. <laughs> but we're British, so we'll do it. Won't we? And we'll do it well because it, doing things well is good. Doing things with excellence is what we're about. It reflects glory on Jesus. We don't do it for Brussels. We do it for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, you're going to have to help me because I've forgotten what I was talking about. <laughs> now, they moved on. They'd been in Gilgal. They'd gone to Bethel. But they moved on. And they took this journey. And they, the next place they came to was a, a place called Jericho. It's interesting that they kept moving because each of those places were good places. Each of those places were necessary places, but each was the foundation for the next. And it's possible to find people, even to find churches that are camped in one place and are still back where they were. They're still celebrating something good, but they are not stepping into all that God has for them. This next place is called Jericho. You will know and I know that Jericho figures in Scripture quite a lot. It figured in, a, in an early manifestation in the book of Joshua and it was the first fortified walled city that the people of Israel came to when they crossed over the River Jordan. It was a place that had memories for them. They remembered the spies that Moses sent out. They remembered the testimony of the spies. Ten were bad, two were good. 
They remembered that on the testimony of the ten, the people were consigned for a generation to wander in the wilderness until they died. They remembered the power of an evil report. They remembered the power of words. They remembered the power of negativity. They remembered all of that. But now they had come, their ancestors were gone, and they came to this place and they remembered the message that this place spoke. It was the place of their national victory, the place of victory, the place where they remembered their fathers under Joshua had come to a place and God had given them heavenly strategy, divine strategy. And with that strategy, they would be able to step into that place, though it was walled, though it was defended, Though there were soldiers, though there were strategies, yet God would give them a superior strategy and a superior strength to break through the wall and get the victory in the first place that they came to. So they remembered this. They remembered that they were a people that had victory woven into the fabric of the national character. They remembered that they were people not called to defeat. They were people who had left slavery behind, God had broken the yoke of slavery. He'd brought them to a place of understanding his presence. And now he'd brought them to a place of understanding the need for victory. Do you know uh, what you can't have victory without? You can't have victory without conflict. You can't have victory without conflict. How many have ever had conflict in their lives? I think that's sort of self-evident, everybody has. If you haven't, you will. Put your hand down, sir. You've had more than anybody else. That's good. And you're a fighter. Good. Well, you're a victor. In fact, Paul says it in this in Romans chapter 8. He's talking about the love of God and he says the love of God is such a profound thing. It is so wonderful. It is so big. It is so vast that nothing, Nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, no created thing, no power, no strength, no, no might, no demon, nothing can separate us from God's wonderful love. And it's by this love he wants to make us more than conquerors. So if you want to be a victor, God wants more for you. He wants you to be more than a conqueror. He just doesn't want you to have victory. He wants you to have more than victory, more than conquest. He wants you to live in an overflowing expression of victory. And so whatever comes your way, and things will come your way, then they are intended by God to give you the platform to live in victory. Sometimes we see trouble coming our way and we turn and run the other way. How many have ever done that? Well, James says it like this. He says this, James chapter 1 verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you see various trials come your way. So when you see them coming, be joyful. Recognize that something is afoot. Something is happening. Something precious, something powerful is happening. God is arranging the affairs of your life on the earth to be set up for another level of victory. After all, he intends that you should live from one level of glory to another, to another, to another. And, and the mechanism by which you rise is to win, is to defeat some obstacle, is to overcome. That's the intention God has for you. So he allows this to come your way. That's why James writes as he does, count it all joy. So that when various trials come your way, your faith might be refined. Your, your, your faith may, may be like purified gold. And he, he ends verse 2 like this, then... So he's now talking about after the fact. He says, then you will be complete, perfect, and you will lack nothing. How many would like to be complete, perfect, and to lack nothing? Well, here's the recipe. Here is the recipe. Don't run away when you see trouble coming your way. Recognize that trouble is the means, is the, is the mechanism that God will use to overcome because he wants you to be an overcomer. Maybe relational, it may be in the world of medicine, it may be in the world of your health, it may be financial, it may be in any kind of way, but recognize because God is present, then you are not standing there on your own. And God is in you and with you, and he's wanting to enable you to rise and to turn that problem heading your way into a stepping stone to a greater manifestation 
of, uh, in your life, his presence in your life. Sometimes we run the other way when troubles come our way, but the intention of God is that they will be the means by which we step into greater levels of victory. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this of Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The pattern is the same. He endured the pain, the ignominy, the, the pain, the, the anguish, the, the, the agony, the brutality of the cross. He endured all of that so that he might enjoy what lay beyond. And what lay beyond was the gathering of sons and daughters from around the world, a process that's been going, going on for 2,000 years. The fourth place is this, because they didn't even stay there as good as victory is. They had to go on to yet another place. And the last place they came to in this journey between Elisha and Elijah was the place called Jordan. If you were to look on a map, you would find all of these places are relatively close together. These are not long journeys. They're, they're journeys they took on foot. It probably took them a few hours, but they're all relatively close together. They could walk these in, uh, in a relatively short time. And so the next place they went to was this place called Jordan. Not so much a, a location like the other places, but a river. It was a river that was significant. It was the river where Jesus was baptised. It's the river that still flows in the nation of Israel today. It's a place that was significant then. Significant because it was a line of demarcation. Because they would cross over from one side to the other and in stepping over from one to the other, they were into the land that God had promised them. It was another place, another jurisdiction if you like. God's authority was was on them to possess this place. And that's the very language that God used. You can read this in Joshua chapter 1. And God says to Joshua, I want you to go in and possess the land. Possess the land. This is a place that I'm giving to you. There are people living there now. There are all kinds of tribes and kindred that are living there, but I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you authority. You go and take dominion. You go and possess the land. This was a challenge that came to those people and uh, it, it continues to this very day. It's one of those things that always or regularly appears in our news services still, the ownership of much of that land. But God said here to Joshua, I want you and your people to possess the land. Now, this was really a, a statement that comes to us by way of a sp spiritual analogy. And, and it is how we possess the land in which we live. It's how we bring godly influence to the place where God has planted us. We can't bring godly influence without the story of Gilgal. We need the story that comes next, Bethel. We need the one that comes next, Jericho. And we need, what, we need to remember what it is to cross over into a place of influence, a place of influence. What does it mean, influence? Does it mean that we own everything and control everything and we pull the strings in society? No, it doesn't mean that at all. World history, Christian history, it tells some very sad tales and stories about what it's like when the church controls everything. Because usually God is pushed out of the picture and in reality men in fancy dress control things and the story is never happy. But this is not about controlling things. This is about a church that serves, that brings godly influence to serve a community. Godly influence to reveal God by carrying the spirit of Jesus into the world where we live. I'll tell you one quick story as I finish. Some years ago, I visited a church in Sydney. It's a little town in Australia. You may not have heard of it, but this, this was an inner city church in a part of Sydney called Newtown. Newtown is, uh, in, is what's called Inner West, and uh, that's probably part of the most deprived part of the community you could imagine. It was uh, in that part of the city that the government uh, in years gone by had built large high-rise uh, apartment blocks and they would, I, I think in this country we would call it social housing. It's called something else in Australia but that would be what we would call it here. So uh, into those high-rise apartment blocks, these, these social experiments were people of, of, uh, of great challenge, many of them. 
It, it was people that had mental issues, drug problems, all kinds of things. And they were put into these apartment blocks and the church I visited was very near to these. In fact, there were two of these side by side and in between them there was a grassed courtyard that had been originally built as a barbecue area. You know what Australians are like with barbecues, so uh, they had to have one of those. So um, they, uh, uh, the church was ministering there. The time I visited the church, every Saturday for two years, for the two years before I came, uh, the church had been serving these communities. And they served in this way. Every Saturday, they would go and they would conduct a little service in that grassed barbecue area. Somebody like Neil would take a guitar and sing a few songs. Um, those who know Neil would say, there's no one like Neil. But, you know, they, someone would take a guitar and they would sing a few songs. Uh, they would get someone to share a little testimony and, and one of the leaders would share a little word, not a, not a sermon, but just a little encouragement from the scriptures. Uh, and little by little, over two years, more and more people had come to this little meeting. Then they would have been through the week, they'd have gone to some place where they could buy soap or tea towels or chocolate or something. And every week they would do that. And to every one of these doors, and there was well over a hundred of them, they would knock and they would give a gift to everybody that was home and wanted to receive it. It was soap, it was chocolate, it was tea towels, it was something for the kitchen, something for the bathroom, something for the bedroom, whatever it was, something different every week. And it was simply a gift from the church. And little by little, these people would come down and the lady, I, I met one lady and I'll never forget this dear old lady. She was well over 80 when I met her. Her name was Elizabeth. And uh, I said to Elizabeth, tell me your story. And she said, well, when I was a young girl, and many of you who are older might, might remember, and I know none of you are that old, but, but you, would, uh, you would remember the days that Elizabeth was describing. She said, when I was very young, I, we lived in a, in a in a suburb, I lived with my family, and uh, everybody knew everybody. And I knew the people next door and next door and next door and next door. I knew those people all around, all down here, people over the back fence, I knew those people. Everybody knew everybody. None of us would lock our door. If we had a car, nobody would take the keys out of the ignition. Nothing was locked. Everything was safe. People would say, hey, I'm going to the shop. Can I get something for you? There was this sense of community. She said, and then I ended up here. And I've been here for a few years now, she said. And when I came here, my God, she said, it was, it was a new world to me. She said, I got to the point where I was afraid to look at people in the eye because people would be so aggressive. She said, I didn't know whether they were mentally ill. I don't know whether they were drug affected. But outside my door, I would hear of a knife slashing somebody and the scream of pain as a knife entered their body or a gunshot somewhere on my, on my floor or, or the floors up or down from where I live. I, I would hear the sound of fights every day. I would hear people coming, buying drugs at, at, at a door and moving on. There, there were people who were so oppressed they would jump off the top and they would kill themselves others would be pushed off in some murderous thing she said I was afraid to go outside my door I was just afraid to even live my life and if I did go out the door because I had to buy some groceries I wouldn't look at anybody I would just keep my eyes down as I made my way down to the to, out of the complex into the shopping center then she said this but ever since the church came possess the land ever since the church came possess the land ever since the church came she said little by little it's got better every week she said now I have people knock on my door and they say Elizabeth I'm going to the supermarket can I buy something for you do you need anything she said now I get up and go out my door I'm not afraid and all of these people that were once wielding knives and carrying guns she said now those people don't have their knives and their guns anymore now they all greet me they all look me in the eye and I'm quite happy to look them in the eye nobody's jumped off the top of this building for years nobody's thrown anybody off the top of the building for years all of those things are long in the past this is a new place now why I said I said to her why why is that and she said well it's because the church started singing some songs sharing some testimonies and opening the Bible. She said, me too, I've given my life to Christ. 
And all of the people I met that day, they were people that had been through every dark and unimaginable place you could think of, and yet most of them had come to Christ. That's what possess the land means. It doesn't mean own it. It doesn't mean control it. It means serve with the spirit of Jesus. He who said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. That's what possessing the land means. It means bring heaven to the earth. Bring the presence of God to the earth. Bring transformation that, that only comes from Jesus. Manifest that through the way that you serve. The story ends with Elijah going to heaven. Just before he went... He said to Elisha, what do you want me to do for you? If you've got a request, make it. He said, well, Elijah, I'd like a double portion of what you got. See, the new generation, they want God. They don't want the church. They don't want any kind of religion. The world's done enough. The world's got enough damage that's the scars of religion. But they want God. And Elisha speaks for every young person on this planet who says, I want a double portion of the Spirit of God. He wasn't saying, Elijah, you got nothing. Elijah, your impact has been small. He wasn't saying that. He was saying God is a big God. And God is able to do much more in the future than he's done in the past. God is able to do so much more and everything that we have seen in history, God is able to do a whole lot more in the future. And yet it starts today. You can have a wonderful life if you live in Gilgal. But it's all about you. It's not wrong, it's not bad, but it's not about others. And that's the heart of God, it's always about others. You can have a wonderful life. If you live in Bethel, the presence of God, it's necessary and you can't do anything without that. But it's not about serving others. That's the heart of God. You can have a wonderful life living in victory and the reason you live in victory is that you'll be able to share victory for others. And that's really what possessing the land is all about. It's intentionally, with deliberateness, stepping into a world and saying, we will not live for ourselves. We will live to serve the community where God has planted us. That this place of Dover, this place of Whitfield, wherever you live, that that will be a place that I can serve and do something that will bring transformation like this church did to this broken community in Newtown, in Sydney. I'd love you to pray with me as I finish. Love you to pray with me as we close. Hand back to Marcus in a moment. He's mentioned a little earlier uh, some prayer that he's going to pray and lead you in. Uh, but before he comes, why don't we just pray together? Why don't we pray together? And Phoebe will come back to the keyboard right now and uh, just begin to play as she does. Let's be very conscious that God's Spirit is here. We want to be faithful to His Word and faithful to the opportunities that his word opens up. And uh, I'm going to pray as Phoebe just plays in the background. Father in heaven, I thank you today for, Lord, the story of Elijah and Elisha. Lord, it's a, it, it's a great narrative, it's a great insight into history, but also into the present. And Father, we want to be people who live in the present. Lord, we want to draw from the invisible realm of heaven that which we need to live in the present the way you want us to live. Victorious, no more slaves, living in the presence of God, living in victory so that we can be more than overcomers, but living out of victory so that we can serve the society. For Lord, you didn't save us that we might live in isolation, but that we might serve the purpose that Jesus began. That what he started to do in the preaching of the gospel would be carried on by his body, the church, in this day. I've said at the start today that while this is an old story, it has a very present application. 
And this is really about you. It's about me. It's about today. It's about now. It's about Jesus, how we serve him, how we experience him, and how we are the feet and the hands and the voice that carry him to the world in which we live. Right across the room now, I'm asking you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And in, in a moment, Pastor Marcus will come and lead you in a prayer. But before he does, I just want to give any, anyone and everyone the opportunity to say, Lord Jesus, that's the life I want to live. I want to live the life that's the Jordan life, built upon all of those other things that's built upon fundamental experiences of God in my life. But some might never have experienced God in their life in any way, in any shape, in any form. God is just a word carrying the idea of a distant entity far away who cares nothing for me now. Well, I think you'll know from today, from your experience of music and seeing people and hearing people, that you're in the company of people who don't believe that. They believe God is here. God is real. God is present. God is able. And if you want to reach out to Him today, I want to tell you a verse from the Bible. It says this, Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when you can take a step towards God, when your heart can connect with His heart. And a process of transformation begins to take place from that encounter. It's called a faith encounter, simply trusting that God's Word is true. And then He begins to lead you on a journey in the company of other people who will show you what it is to follow Jesus. And today, if that's you and you're saying, I want to take this first step to being a follower of Jesus, to living the kinds of life I've been hearing about, then I want to be courageous enough to take that step. If that's you today, right now, right where you are in this place, find the courage in your heart to say, I will lift my hand to indicate that I will take the first step to follow Jesus. If that's you, lift your hand now. I'm going to pray with you. If that's you, just lift your hand. So I want to follow Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of people. Thank you. Just drop your hand down. A couple of people have done that. Maybe there's others and I've missed them. But if you would like to join those that have done that, I, I don't, this is the most important question anybody will ever ask you as long as you live. Just simply lift your hand. Drop it down. I'm going to pray in a moment. Pastor Marcus will come and lead in a prayer for, for that and some other things. But I, I wouldn't want you to miss this opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. Remember that. Today. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow hasn't yet come. You have the guarantee of now and you have no other guarantee. Except God loves you and has made a way for you to live in victory. Lift your hand if you want to join those that have already done so and that believe God. Maybe there are people today you've walked with Jesus in the past, but you know in the truthful, honest mirror of reality that you know you're not walking with Him now. You're not walking with Him now. You can lift your hands in the right place in the song. You can say the right things as people shake your hand and kiss you. But you know deep in your heart there's a wall. The wall is built up around your heart and it's broken you. It's broken fellowship with God in that close, intimate way that you once knew. Well, that can be broken today. I'd love you to give that opportunity as well. Lift your hand if that's you. I want to pray for you as well. Simply lift your hand if you would say, I want to be closer to Jesus. I want the hard shell of hard-heartedness to be broken. I want to feel his touch. If that's you, lift your hand. Lift your hand. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for those that have indicated today that they want to follow Jesus. In a moment, Pastor Marcus will come and lead us in another prayer and lead us in a way that is right. Father, I pray that all of us will be responsive. All of us will hear your word. All of us will obey your word. And all of us will rejoice in the reality of Jesus in our lives. We ask you and we give you thanks.